Welcome to this month's webinar of featured, well, sorry, funded and sponsored by our economics website, Making Sense of Today's Crop Nutrition Research. Welcome to, yeah, let's start. Let's talk about starter fertilizer. My name is Dr. Christy Preston. I'm a senior agronomist with Nutrien, and mainly I cover most of the Midwest. Today, I will be discussing starter applications in corn, reasons why you should consider it this spring. If you have any questions, you can submit them to the Q&A session down at the bottom. Um, if you did apply for the CEU credits for today, there will be a QR code following the presentation if you view it live. If not, the recording will be posted to the economics website at a later time. And, but if you registered, you'll, you'll get a reminder whenever it is posted and you will have to complete the five question quiz. And with that, let's get started. So some of the top reasons for using a starter fertilizer this spring. And when I was putting together this list, I mean, it just, it kept, kind of, felt like it kept going on and on and on, but there are a lot of reasons why you should consider a starter fertilizer in your corn production this year. And we'll go into each one of, maybe not each one of these individually, but we will talk about them as a whole. The biggest one is nutrient availability and the immobility of some nutrients. You really want that uniform emergence and early crop growth and uptake. And I, as I was doing some research to try to put together some data for this presentation, I listened to an interview with uh, Brandy Dowdy, who was uh, the gentleman who produced 500 bushel corn in, I believe, Georgia. And he talks so passionately about getting uniform emergence and making sure that the crop comes up uniformly across the field, because if it doesn't come up uniformly, then you're potentially losing yield. Early plant or cooler soils. If you have cooler planting conditions, phosphorus availability may be limited. High residue or cover crops. We've, we've been hearing a lot of information coming from the lack of nutrient cycling if you're using cover crops in your rotation. So making sure that your plants aren't deficient early on. How crop rotation and fallow ground may affect phosphorus availability. Uh, no tillage or poorly, poorly drained soils. Starter application can lead to earlier maturity and increased or well decreased dry down time once that grain is harvested. We'll talk a little bit about rented ground. And then finally, uh, replanted failed crops. So I got to thinking last night, I said, you know, when I used to present in front of people, I always had to have, you know, the action slide or something that would draw people's attention to make sure that they weren't sleeping. And I got to thinking, gosh, the several, the last several presentations that I've done, I haven't included a slide that's kind of like a, hey, wake up, it's, uh, it's Tuesday morning. And so here in the U.S., it's tax season. And so, you know, when the tax man comes snooping around, this is, this is why you wrote off your RV. I've used this slide so many times. And this tweet is just amazing. So if you're on Twitter, please follow 180 Yield Failure. They have some of the funniest things. But so if the tax man comes snooping, this is why you know, you try why the farmer tried to write off his camper because he's using it to pull a grain cart. I try to start every presentation with the basics of agronomy. And one of the major concepts that a lot of farmers don't seem to, to really grasp is Liebig's law of the minimum. And we've all seen the barrel, but at economics, we actually have the dam. And if you think about how the dam holds back water, it's holding, it's holding on to that yield potential. And as most say, your highest yield potential is the day that the seed hits the ground. 
that's the point of the highest yield potential that you can possibly have. Guess what? Everything from there is downhill. And so this dam is holding back the most yield potential that we can possibly have. Well, our yield limiting factors, nitrogen, sulfur, potassium, phosphorus, even water, herbicide use, all of these can create holes in this dam and make it leak. But the law of the minimum says that your yield will be limiting by your most limiting factor. So even though I plug the nitrogen hole and I have ample amount of nitrogen for that plant to take up, if I still have holes in phosphorus, potassium, and of course, if we could all plan the, the weather, water, we would, all, we would all be millionaires by now, but we have to really plug every single hole to maximize that yield potential. And so we're gonna discuss how starter fertilizer can help maximize that yield potential. We're also very familiar with the concept of the four Rs, the right source, the right rate, the right time, the right place. Starter fertilizer fits into this because you're applying the fertilizer closer, closer to the plant. So that should increase plant availability or plant uptake. It's applying it as the crop is actively growing. So it's at the right time. We just need to figure out how the right source, whether it's liquid or uh, granular, and the right um, rate of, of fertilizer to apply. But all of this also fits into how we protect the environment. So if we can apply fertilizer closer to the plant and have it taken up while the plant is actively growing, we reduce the amount that can be subject to losses and negatively affect the environment. If we can match uptake levels, we can also maximize the economics and the ROI with, these, with starter application. So certain, all the, all the nutrients are either mobile or immobile within the soil. The most common immobile nutrient is phosphorus. That's why whenever we have a conversation about starter application, the number one nutrient is usually phosphorus. It does not move in the soil. If you apply it in a band, if you broadcast it, more than likely it's the only direction it's going to move is down. It might move horizontally a couple of inches, but it's highly unlikely. So the reason why we include phosphorus in starter applications is because 94% of the phosphorus that's taken up by the plant is taken up by diffusion. And what that means is it's a concentration gradient where as the plant takes up phosphorus, more phosphorus is available within say the rhizosphere of the plant because of that concentration gradient. Unlike nitrogen, which is mobile within the soil, which means it moves with water, the majority of nitrogen is taken up by mass flow. Again, based on water movement. Phosphorus is, phosphorus is very immobile within the soil. Now there are other reasons um, like free aluminum, free iron, and we'll talk about pH and how it affects phosphorus um, availability, but again, phosphorus is relatively immobile within the soil. If it moves anywhere, it's going to move down into the soil profile. Just because of a nutrient is mobile within the soil doesn't necessarily mean that it's mobile within the plant. Now, this is a diagram from that IPNI put together that shows where nutrient deficiency symptoms will show up, and mainly I just included it because we are gonna specifically talk about nitrogen and phosphorus and those deficiency symptoms show up in the older tissue. They're not mobile within the soil. So they're not translocated to the newer growing portions of the plant. Okay, so there are all different types of, of starter ap applications that you can make. But the top three really are the in, in furrow or pop-up fertilizer application, 
a surface dribble or what we call a two by two band, which is usually two inches to the side of the seed and two inches below. Now each type of starter application does have its own implications whenever we're considering the fertilizer source that we're using and the rates that are applied. But in general, the idea behind starter application is we're just trying to apply a small amount of fertilizer as close as we can to, to the seed with hopes that we will get some return on, on, that, on that application because we're not having to make another, another application across the field. So I can apply the starter with my planter and not have extra application costs. Usually during planning, and it's usually, a, you know, starter applications associated with trying to increase early growth of the crop of the plant, or of crop plants. So again, cooler growing seasons, we highly recommend you um, earlier planning and for cooler growing seasons, apply a starter fertilizer, get that fertilizer as close as you can to the, to the, to the plant since phosphorus doesn't move if you apply it in a band with a two by two or even a surface dribble or the pop-up, more than likely that fertilizer will come into contact or be close enough to the, seed, to the seed and the emerging plant that it can be taken up. Now, if you apply your starter as the in furrow or pop-up, since you are applying it really close to the seed, that can affect your application rates, particularly nitrogen and yes nitrogen and potassium you have to watch the salting effect of those of those nutrients and fertilizers carry a salt index which you can check out on our economics website we've had several videos or webinars on the topic of salt index and trying to determine application rates but application rates can also depend on your soil texture higher clays, higher um, CECs are capable of holding on to nutrients more and pulling those nutrients away from, not away from the plant, but at least holding them so that you don't have the seedling injury. So a good option if you have the implements on your planter is the two by two because you can apply higher rates of fertilizer because you're a little bit further away from the plant but still close enough that as the plant roots grow, as you get those um, early growth, lateral growth, the fertilizer will be close. And even yields are showing similar to a surface dribble. Again, and that's more than likely going to be using a liquid fertilizer source and applying that to the soil surface. You can, uh, it's already in the, it's already in a liquid form. And so when it hits the soil, it's gonna be readily available. Not saying that granular fertilizers, if you try to apply them with a two by two um, or a liquid with a two by two also, they're just, they don't have to acquire the moisture to be break, broken down to become plant available, which, you shouldn't worry about that with either application. So again, at the end of the day, to decrease our chances of putting our crops in a yield limiting situation, we're looking at applying those nutrients and having them available whenever the plant is actively taking them up. So here we have figure one, which is the nitrogen uptake by a corn plant. And figure number two is the phosphorus uptake by the plant. To start out with, you do have some lag time, but then it significantly increases. And if you don't have the nutrients available to the plant at that time, it could potentially be limiting your, your yield. And so phosphorus in particular can show deficiency symptoms in this early growing period if you have cool soils, or if you have, um, we'll talk more about crop rotation here in a minute, but just understand that phosphorus deficiency symptoms will show up in this early season. 
And a lot of times the, the corn plants will actually grow out of it. But do you really want to, do you really want to wager? Do you really, wouldn't you rather hedge your bets and go ahead and apply starter fertilizer to make sure that it has enough available early on? And then potentially it'll, as the corn roots grow, they go deeper into the soil, they can potentially come into contact with more phosphorus. So this is not Kansas State corn. I am an alumni, so this is not purple corn because K-State developed it. This is phosphorus deficiency. Pretty, I mean, it's pretty apparent whenever you walk out into the field and you see this, this purpling. And of course it happens on the lower leaves because it is, it, phosphorus is not mobile within the plant. And I just included here some of the functions that phosphorus does in the plant. Uh, energy storage and transfer, AD, ATP, cell division and membranes, those phospholipid bilayers of membranes, that's phosphorus, and photosynthesis and respiration. Those are the main, those are the big two. So if my plant is phosphorus deficient, if photosynthesis is decreased, then I'm potentially going to be limiting my yield, my yield. And again, I, I can't stress it enough. It appears in uh, cold spring temperatures. Phosphor phosphorus availability based on pH. I can't stress this enough. If you can apply as much phosphorus as you want to the soil, but if your pH isn't adjusted to the proper area, phosphorus availability can, can be um, decreased due to aluminum and iron, or on the higher pH side, calcium. It's, it's physically tied up in the soil. So it, step number one, I gotta fix my pH. I've gotta know what it is. Step number two is, all right, then let's look at phosphorus and the rates that we need to apply. Another comment here in regards to starter application is some areas do have such acidity or high iron and aluminum that the localized area of a starter or even a band application of phosphorus is needed to tie up that free iron and aluminum and kind of over kind of overpower those ions that are in solution and make phosphorus available to the plant. All right, so let's, let's get into talking about crop rotation and when starter applications need to be applied. There's actually a syndrome called corn after canola. Now, canola and actually sugar beets are another crop that they don't, they're not a host of mycorrhizae. And what mycorrhizae do is they help the corn plant with early phosphorus uptake even as much as increasing the water or the root volume, which increases water uptake as well. If you don't have that, if you don't have mycorrhizae that are active in the soil from a previous crop, and that also includes fallow ground, then that is a great scenario when starter applications can, can show benefit because you don't have the mycorrhizae from the previous crop, or if it's fallow ground, they're not there. They're not helping the plant take up up to 80% of early uptake of phosphorus. So starter application is a great idea. Switching over to something that's more in my realm, this is actually data from my PhD work at Kansas State, where we looked at the same applications of or same applications and placements of phosphor fertilizer for 10 years. And over 10 years, we consistently saw an increase in starter application, even, even when we were broadcasting and deep banding. And this goes back to a, a diagram that I couldn't get my hands on. I'm not entirely sure why I couldn't find it but there was a really great diagram that showed that as you increase, um, increase the amount of fertilizer around the plant, that increased yield. 
and time and time again. So after averaged over 10 years, we saw a yield bump in corn production with broadcast applications. Now, since a lot of times we got to think about the, the entire rotation, we took it one step further and said, all right, what is the residual effects of that phosphorus that's applied before corn on the next crop? Um, this study included other, other treatments where we actually fertilized the soybeans to make sure that the residual, or to check to see if the residual phosphorus from before corn was enough, and actually in some scenarios it wasn't. So throwing in a little tidbit there that a lot of times it's better to fertilize both crops in the rotation. But, on, but anyway... So looking at soybean yields with the fertilizer applied before corn in the rotation, again, should have been high enough rates that there shouldn't have been concern with limitations between the, between the corn and the soybean yield. But even when there was starter applied before the corn, we consistently saw higher yields with, with starter application, whether you were broadcasting it or deep banding your phosphorus. Now the implications with broadcasting versus any type of banding that you do with your fertilizer management programs is the stratification that is gonna be caused in, in the soil profile. So naturally as corn stalks or other residues, as they break down on the soil surface, you're gonna get this stratification in, in the top of the soil. And, but if I come in and if I'm band, doing any type of banding, and I'm sorry, this, this diagram just has the deep band, which was applied six to eight inches deep, but it shows the, the process of, if I apply a liquid fertilizer directly below the plant or in the root zone, how, the phosphorus levels increase over time in a specific area. So we've all thought about horizontal stratification, but there's also, or we've all start, sorry, we've all thought about, yes, horizontal stratification, but there's also vertical stratification within a field. And so now the big question is, if I am gonna come in and apply a band, uh, maybe say in a corn soybean rotation, in the crop row year after year, I am gonna create this area of high concentration. Now, how do I soil sample that? And the question is, and well, we still haven't answered that question yet because it's, it's very difficult. Um, we've seen some recommendations that say one sample in the row so that you hit the band versus, and, and combine that with three to five samples outside of the row at say this 12 to 15 inch area in between the rows. But that's, that's a topic for, for another day. But just realize that if I'm broadcasting my fertilizer year after year, I will create this, this stratification in the, in the top of the soil. And that's naturally gonna happen anyway. It's just gonna be exacerbated with broadcast applications. So a lot of farmers are already adopting split applications of nutrients, and a starter is a great way to apply a little bit and then apply either your nitrogen in the fall before or add a side dress. But again, at the end of the day, we're just trying to match our fertilizer applications with crop uptake. That way we decrease the chances of, of losses and we maximize the ROI. This graph um, came out of Virginia Tech and shows the enhanced nitrogen av availability from starter and band application. So as you increase your starter nitrogen concentration, we also saw an increase in the percent nitrogen within the tissue. What does that say? Well, there would be an, an optimum level of where of where the broadcast application would be 60 pounds of nitrogen with a starter application of around 10. There would be an, 
an economically optimum or an agronomically optimum level of the split of application. Now we actually see a, a similar response or a similar uh, response from the corn crop with phosphorus application. And there is a lot going on at the, in this graph, but there's two main takeaway points that I want to focus on. This is a soil that's high productivity, but low fertility, which means number one, that if it's got low fertility, then more than likely the higher the application rate, the more likely I am to maximize my yield. So as you can see, this top line, which is the 80 pounds of P2O5, is that's the level that it took to maximize my yield. Um, yes, it, that was the maximum amount that to maximize the yield in this, in this trial. The 20 and 40 pounds were not, were not quite enough to reach that economically optimum rate. However, the second point to take away from it is this x-axis is the percent of the total P applied as the starter fertilizer. And as you can see at those lower two rates, even though I'm not reaching economically optimum rate, uh, levels for corn production, the highest levels of, of yield have occurred whenever 100% was applied as a starter application. So if you have low fertility, a starter application is ideal because you're getting that fertilizer closer to the plant, closer to the plant and maximizing the production. At that high rate where we did reach the, the percent maximum yield, we did see a little bit of a drop off here between the 75 and 50. So I would say the optimum amount with that 80 pounds of P2O5 is around the 50%. So 50% applied as a starter, 50% applied as a broadcast whenever you have low soil test levels. Now, part of my PhD work was to collect all the data possible from research publications on the interaction of placement and tillage. And so this research, we split it up into two different sections, low soil test P or below say 20 parts per million. That's what we determined was the critical level where above that level, farmers may not necessarily see a response to fertilizer. So below, you should see a response to fertilizer application. And then the second part was high soil test phosphorus above 20 parts per million. And if you think about low soil test phosphorus, if I'm going to see a response to fertilizer application, maybe phosphorus management practices that fertilize more soil like a broadcast application with tillage here in this first gray box might yield the highest corn yield. Because if you think about it, you are fertilizing more soil. Again, any other process where tillage is actually mixing the fertilizer in the soil, uh, say with a band application might also yield higher, especially in these in soils that are testing low in, in phosphorus. So any type of tillage practice, you're fertilizing more soil, you're potentially going to increase your yields. In no-till systems, you would potentially see higher yields with broadcast applications, but you may not necessarily, um, you'll see lower yields with band application because you're limiting the amount of phosphorus as we discussed earlier with how phosphorus is taken up uh, in the soil, if that phosphorus is not near the plant because it doesn't move in say a band application with no tillage, you could potentially be limiting your yields or may not see higher, high enough corn yields over time whenever there is low soil test phosphorus. Now, on the other hand, in a scenario where there is high soil test phosphorus, you think about there, there is enough phosphorus already in the soil so to maximize crop production because that's the critical level that we've set. Maybe I don't necessarily have to fertilize more soil 
because that's that's the scenario that we were like working with with slow soul test phosphorus but maybe i can benefit from just putting additional phosphorus near near the plant in a band application and so the data that we collected we saw increased yields with banding with some some type of tillage lower yields were seen with broadcast applications with tillage and broadcast applications with no tillage again uh, there are various reasons for applying say starter fertilizer or banding the fertilizer next to the plant this could have been in a scenario where maybe they planted the corn early and needed that needed that initial bump from the fertilizer application being close to the seed and increased germination. But if we think about soil test levels as a whole, soil tests are an average of an average of, we're trying to manage the average within the soil profile. So I'll, I'll add in a little tidbit here of why I agree with a build to maintain approach to phosphorus management. Because if I apply enough fertilizer to get above this 20 part per million soil test level, maybe, uh, maybe I won't be potentially limiting my yields and I can do uh, for phosphorus management practice like banding or using a starter fertilizer that I'm not applying high rates. So again, if we think about economic optimum yields, we're looking in this, this area right here. The critical is somewhere in between a medium and high range for soil test levels. And that's usually around a maintenance approach to fertilizer, fertilizer applications. So I've built up my soil test levels. I have them above optimum. Maybe I just need to come in and apply the a starter fertilizer, specifically with phosphorus, to make sure that I don't limit my yields early on, like we talked about um, earlier, not, not harming emergent issues. Some data out of Minnesota from Fabian looked at increasing phosphorus rate and how that affected corn yield with three different tillage and placement systems. So here we have no-till broadcast or NTBC, no-till deep band, NTBD, and strip-till DB. As you applied some type of tillage, as, as we saw in some of my work that I did at Kansas State, as you do some type of tillage, conventional or strip till, you're fertilizing more soil. So we consistently see higher yields regardless of the phosphorus rate applied. But if I'm in a no-till system, I'm seeing a yield response to the phosphorus applied as either a a broadcast or a deep band, I have to apply more fertilizer to reach those higher yields in that no-till system. And that's because the, the roots are, I'm going to anthropomorphize the roots, but they're searching for food. And if it's not coming to, th to them through water like nitrogen, then we need to make sure that it's closer to the plant. And now going back to the 4R approach. So at the end of the day, we are trying to apply nutrients as stewardly as possible, stewardly as possible to maximize uptake and availability to reduce losses. And it's no secret that in if I subsurface apply phosphorus, it's going to potentially decrease my, my chances of of losses. So a, a starter band or a deep band, I can potentially decrease the amount that's lost. If I'm going to surface apply phosphorus and my field is subject to loss potential, I should probably consider some type of incorporation.
All right, so let's talk about some ROI. I briefly mentioned that there is some saving or there, there could be potentially some saving with drying down the grain quicker whenever if, with a starter application. So apply my starter, I could decrease my time to maturity and also decrease the, the time that it would take to dry down my grain because it dries down quicker in the field. Um, so just a scenario here that I found that we have on the economics website is a potential cost savings of about $7,000. If you think about corn moisture being at 25%, the drying down being around 30 cents per bushel in just the propane alone, that's a cost of about $25,000. Okay. Well, now let's say that we've applied a starter the moisture levels down to say 22% and drying down would only be 20 cents per bushel. Okay, so some savings there if I can get the grain to dry down quicker. And of course, you know, I said earlier that I always try to include the, the basics in any of my presentations. And we talked about phosphorus stratification within the soil. So we need to make sure that we, we take a proper soil sample because this is how we're going to determine uh, our phosphorus rates. I mean, that's the whole point of soil sampling is I've got my nutrients that I'm going to see the highest uh, return on investment, which is phosphorus and potassium. Now, how do I figure out how much to apply? So use clean soil sampling tools, take it at a consistent depth. And this is some research from, again, from Kansas State. We see this stratification layer on the top of the soil surface. If I take a six inch sample, my, my soil test levels will come back at 15 parts per million. Guess what? That means I need to apply more, that, that means I need to apply more fertilizer. But if I only take it to four inches deep and it comes back at 22, then, I, I may potentially be limiting my yield because these soil tests are correlated and calibrated to corn yield and what the corn plant sees within the soil in this top six inches. I collect enough cores. If I am going to be banding, I need to consider if I'm hitting that band or not. And like I mentioned, there's been some research that shows that maybe one sample in the corn row and three samples outside and mix those together. That way I get the average, uh, but you know, there's not, there's not a lot of, uh, there's not a lot of certainty with soil sampling in that regard. But if I take enough subsamples, I can potentially uh, mask that variability within the field. And so within one sample, if I take somewhere between 15 to 20 cores, then more than likely I will sample and be able to, um, to be able to say, yes, I've sampled that variability within the field. And of course, mix thoroughly. Ta also talking about phosphorus rain. This is a tool that we have on the economics website where, um, where you can play around with your phosphorus application rates to determine, you know, what might result in the, the greatest ROI. Traditionally, you know, you can, you can run your scenario. You've applied the same amount year after year based on this yield goal. And yeah, but then you can go in and actually check it to see, hey, maybe what if I up this another 10 to 20 pounds? What would that, what would that show me economically how it affects my ROI? Can I potentially increase my yield? Is my yield, am I applying my, enough to meet that yield level? Spatial variability is, is the key. Again, soil samples, if you're soil sampling on a two and a half acre grid, they're going to be in your critical level. This is, this picture is actually for potassium. But if your critical level is around 160, as it is in Iowa, and your soil test levels come back at 165, 
you're going to have areas within that two and a half acre grid that come back below those critical levels. And you could be potentially limiting your yield because adequate potassium isn't available. So play around with the tool. Um, here's another view of it. It's very simple to choose a crop, a nutrient. We are limited on the data that's available um, for our model. So there's, if you choose phosphorus, there are several regions we can try to get as close as possible. But again, we're limited on the data that's published. Your soil test levels, your acreage, your yield potential. And, you know, if you are a progressive farmer and you say, hey, yeah, I want to increase, I want to increase my yield potential. I feel like this is, this year is going to be the year. Put that in there and it'll tell you how much you need to apply to potentially get to that yield level. Because if we don't push those boundaries, then we might, put, we might never get away from, you know, what we've done year after year. And then, of course, the economics, the crop price, the, the nutrient prices per ton, and um, desired fertilizer rate. All right. So I came back to this slide one more time, uh, just as a, as a conclusion slide. Nutrient availability, and mobil uh, nutrient availability and immobility. The reason why we apply phosphorus so early in the growing season is because it's immobile within the soil. If you've never listened to an interview by Rand Randy Dowdy, and literally I added this this morning because I was looking for a particular webinar that I had heard before, and I heard an interview with him, and he said, uniform emergence is absolute key. And guess how you get uniform emergence? Starter applications. If you're planting early in cooler soils, consider a starter application. Uh, we really didn't go into high residue and cover crops, but anytime you might have, uh, say, this might be the year that farmers are considering switching from corn to corn in the rotation, that high residue from the previous year might, uh, might cause issues with the plant's ability to take up those nutrients. And on another note, if if I am going corn to corn, keep in mind that a corn plant removes 70% of the phosphorus that's taken up. That's quite a high percentage whenever, you know, whenever you're comparing it to a corn soybean rotation, 70%. That means it's leaving the field. It's not there and available to, to cycle back whenever the organic matter breaks down. Realize that cover crops can potentially tie up nutrients and keep those in an, orga in an organic form and may not be available for that buffer crop the next year. This uh, caveat statement to add on to that is some research out of Kansas State with Nathan Nelson. He's actually showing an increase in phosphorus losses with cover crop use, because if you think about it, as that cover crop is consistently growing whenever another system that doesn't use a cover crop wouldn't have something actively growing and phosphorus moves based on a concentration gradient, there may be some implications of that cover crop on keeping phosphorus in an available form as it's being taken up. Anyway, so crop rotation, fallow ground, um, watch what crop you are following. If it's sugar beets, if it's canola, might not have the mycorrhizae in the soil and might need to apply a starter fertilizer. Uh, no tillage systems definitely need to have uh, a starter application. Earlier to maturity, decreased dry, dry down time. And I didn't actually have a slide on rented ground, but this is a good topic of conversation right now, because if I don't know a lot about the field, if I haven't taken the time to properly soil sample it, if I'm just renting it for a short term lease, I really want to make sure that I have those nutrients available early in the growing season, because I don't know what's out there. So any type of rented ground, 
if I don't want, if I'm not going to invest in it long term and do, say, a build to maintain approach and build up those soil test levels, a starter is a great, great fertilizer source that you can use. And then briefly, replanting failed crops. So if now last year we had we had a wet spring here in much of the Midwest and a lot of farmers found themselves having to come back and, and replant before that before the insurance insurance day. Starter fertilizer can help make sure that that crop gets, that second planted crop gets up out of the ground and potentially, uh, potentially get it going. That way you can maximize your yields even though the first, first round kind of didn't work out. Okay, so as promised, you can have one CEU if you stuck with me through this entire thing. I feel like I went through it very fast, but it was, it was a lot of information. There are a lot of different scenarios where a starter fertilizer may be, may be a good idea for your production. And there's several different types. If I have the two by two implements that I can apply on my planner, that's great. But even just something as simple as a dribble band on the soil surface, that, that's getting that nutrients in a liquid form. It's going to kind of, I, I said it wasn't going to, phosphorus doesn't move within the profile, but it will move, it will move somewhat down into the soil profile. So having it beside the plant early on is, would potentially make sure. In my mind, it means I'm hedging my bets. I don't want to, if, if the corn plant is at its highest yield potential the day that it hits the soil because of, you know, all of our genetics that we've pumped into seeds, if that is the case, then I need to make sure that those nutrients are not going to be limited or my yield might suffer. All right, so we will go into some questions. I thank you all for the opportunity and thank you for sticking with me if you did through this. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free to submit them in the QRA or the q and I'm not sure what, what Aaron wants to do, um, but if we go back and we listen to the recording and my, you know, my voice did drop off too much. Um, it's, you know, technology issues these days. I, I have no issues with going back in and re-recording. Visit us, um, Nutrien.com, at NutrienLTD if you're on Twitter. The economics website, Nutrien-Economics.com, and definitely follow us on Twitter. Our goal is to bring you basic agronomy and hopefully help you identify yield-limiting factors and and rectify them as efficiently as possible. So our first question says, which soil, te soil phosphorus test do you trust most when making a recommendation or determining the critical P level? Bray 1, Bray, uh, Malik 3, Olson P, or uh, other extractions? And that's a great question. It depends. It depends. I am sorry. I hate that I started that that answer out with that. Um, but it really does depend where you are geographically, and I believe pH of the soil as well. The malic and the bray are very closely related. There is some correlation there with um, with determining critical p levels. There is some. Uh, uh, a coefficient to determine if they are similar. The Olson P, I believe, is for higher pH soils or calcium carbonate soils. I hope I'm saying that right, but it really depends on where you are geographically within the different states and what that soil test laboratory uses. So I can't stress enough that if you are going to if you are going to follow the critical level or any recommend or any soil test levels that a lab gives you, you really need to follow their sampling protocol that they have on their website because those soil test levels are correlated to 
what the core implant is going to see. And so a BRAIN 1 might come back a little different than a Malik 3, but say, uh, my, of course, my experience rests within Virginia Tech and Kansas State, and they both have switched over to the Malik systems. They've done countless numbers of years of research to determine those critical levels. But again, at the end of the day, remember I talked about spatial variability. I kind of want to hedge my bets and do more of a build to maintain approach with a nutrient like phosphorus because I don't want to have areas within the field that that are below that critical level and not have the maximum amount of phosphorus that they need. With that being said, also do that as environmentally friendly as possible. And of course, the rest of the comments kind of uh, kind of uh, along the lines of my microphone. So I want to thank everybody for joining us on this month's e episode, this month's webinar for economics. Happy Tuesday to 2222. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us on the economics website. We love to hear from you and we love answering questions that are uh, pertinent to your production. I will add in another caveat statement and say that a lot of our tools on our website allow you to enter in your farm specific data. And that is key. Site specific data is key to maximizing your, um, your production system. If I can maximize, well, if I have any questions whatsoever on my own farm, I all I do is I'll run a yes, no test. I am very much a huge promoter of if I take what I've been doing and I want to apply, say, 10 to 20 pounds more phosphorus to see if I can maximize yields or if I want to apply a starter this year to see uh, if I can see a difference, then I try it. You know, you only have to take one, one ten thousandth of an acre and, and run that trial yourself. But if you have any questions, let us know. Thank you.